So we're pleased to have Garrett Dirkmont as uh, presenter this year. He's an assistant professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. He received his PhD in American history from the University of Colorado in 2010, where he studied 19th century American expansionism and foreign relations. His dissertation was titled, Enemies, Foreign and Domestic, U.S. Relations with Mormons in the U.S. Empire in North America, 1844-1854. He worked as a historian and writer for the Church History Department from 2010 to 2014 as historian on several volumes of the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Since taking his position at BYU, he continues to work on the Joseph Smith Papers as a historian and writer. He currently serves as editor of the academic journal Mormon Historical Studies, published by the Mormon Historical Sites Foundation, and on the Church History Editorial Board for BYU Studies. There's a lot more here you might want to take a look at. But uh, with that, we're going to introduce Garrett Dirkmatt. All right, thank you, Scott. Uh, sorry, it was a little bit hard to find. I was trying to find one of those ice cream bars, and I couldn't find it, and so I thought, you know, well, I was going to protest and not even come at this. Oh, you have one, obviously. Uh, you know, as soon as they get a little authority as they suppose, they, of course he's going to end up with an ice cream bar. Um, uh, I, I haven't presented at the Fair Mormon Conference before, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, and then I apologize uh, if I don't do a very good job. Um, the, the topic that, uh, that I discussed with Scott and that we're going to talk about um, comes from the, the newly released uh, Council of 50 Minutes. Uh, as many of you know, the Joseph Smith Papers and the Church History Department um, uh, just recently, several months ago, published the... Uh, the annotated uh, Council of 50 Minutes from the Nauvoo era. And there are all kinds of, of uh, insights into early uh, Mormon history as well as, as, as late Nauvoo and early Brigham Young Nauvoo history uh, and, and church history that we get uh, from those minutes. And so if, if you haven't had a chance uh, to look at them, um, it, it really is a, a powerful, powerful source for people that are interested in history. And one of the reasons why is we rarely get to have from this period of Mormon history a kind of uh, 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 direct discussion that is, that, is, that, is, that is kept the entire time they're having it. Often you're getting sometimes some highlights of a discussion or you're getting uh, what someone kept down as notes, but because William Clayton kept pretty good notes in what he was doing, um, you actually get to see a little bit of what their fears and their concerns and what their angst are. And one of the things you get out of, of course, is that since these documents had never before been public, we have things that they discuss and say and teachings that they present that have never been public before either. And so I thought that might be of at least some interest uh, to you. And, and if I do a bad enough job, you know, Dan Bat's clean up anyway and he can make it, you can still leave here feeling good, right? Um, so the Council of 50 uh, originates uh, in early 1844, and for those of you who are really familiar with this period of Mormon history, um, you know, for someone who studies it for a really long time, you just assume everyone is really familiar with it because, because you study it all the time. But um, this is after Joseph Smith has declared himself to be a candidate for president of the United States. Uh, in 1843, Joseph Smith has uh, grown in increasingly disenchanted with the uh, political parties of the day. Uh, we're all familiar with, I'm sure you're all familiar with Joseph Smith's uh, visit to D.C. to try to get a redress of grievances from uh, Martin Van Buren, from the Congress, and the various petitions that they signed. And by uh, mid-1842, Joseph uh, seemed to be gravitating towards uh, the Whig Party and the Whig Party candidate uh, Henry Clay. Clay was a very well-known uh, politician, the great compromiser, and he was someone who uh, was seen as someone willing to defend the rights of the minority. And so I think Joseph had really put a lot of eggs into his basket. At any rate, he decided to abandon the Democratic Party. I know it's really hard to believe, but almost every Mormon uh, in, in the 1840s and 30s was a Democrat. Um, and the, uh, this movement away is, is captured a little bit. You see a little bit of Joseph's angst. Uh, in probably the greatest quote ever given by Joseph Smith, but also the one that all of you are now going to misuse in, in a high priest group. Um, 
uh, as he's giving this interview to, to David Nye White of the Pittsburgh Weekly Gazette, he says, I have sworn by the eternal gods that I will never vote for another Democrat again. I intend to swear my children, putting their hands under the thigh as Abraham swore Isaac, that they will never vote a Democratic ticket in all their generations. It is the meanest, lowest party in all creation, the lowest, most tyrannical beings in the world. They opposed me in Missouri and were going to shoot me for treason, and I had never committed any treason whatsoever. Right? So, um, again, now you're all going to take that out of context and, and abuse it. And um, I, Exactly. Yeah, someone's like, you bet I am. Yeah, exactly. I know what you're going to do. Um, they kind of get an idea of how disenchanted uh, Joseph has become with the leadership in the Democratic Party. And he's written letters to all of the declared presidential candidates, or the people who at least hinted that they might be running. It's, it's hard to believe, but their system for selecting a presidential candidate was even more chaotic and difficult than ours. Uh, they simply had state delegations uh, send people to a convention, and then they would argue and bribe and, and feed people whiskey to try to get votes on the convention floor. So you never really knew who was going to be running. Joseph wrote to all the people who had at least expressed interest in running or people who thought they were running. And one by one by one, they all responded back to him. Not all of them, but the ones who did respond told him that, uh, that they wouldn't help the Mormons at all if they, if, if they were to be elected. And finally, one of the ones he receives is from Henry Clay. So Joseph goes from thinking he could support Henry Clay as a candidate for president to having Henry Clay in a very, very high-minded way and very sympathetic. Oh, I felt so badly to see what's happened to your people. But as president, there's nothing I could possibly do to help you out. And after this, Joseph Smith will declare himself to be a candidate for president, earning him the undying hatred of both the Whigs and Democrats. Um, uh, so it, it probably wasn't the best move uh, politically for the Mormons. Um, but it's in this context that, that uh, Joseph is going to uh, create uh, the, the Council of 50. He's already declared himself a candidate for president, but at the same time, he knows that the church is unlikely to find respite anywhere in the United States. In many ways, the church is looking to leave the United States because they believe American democracy has failed them. Right? Uh, they have been in multiple places, and everywhere they go, the very fact of their presence, their power, their political nature, their crazy religious ideas are going to lead to opposition, and that opposition um, uh, is, is at times violent and difficult. Um, in his uh, declaration uh, of, of his views for presidency, we find uh, some, some odd uh, aspects of it. Uh, probably one of the, the most interesting of this is that he... He states, in the beginning of it, uh, in, the, in the second paragraph, he uh, makes an attack against slavery in the United States, which you would think is a pretty common thing in 19th century America. We think of 19th century America as being everyone, the only thing they ever talk about is slavery. But it's not actually a, a, a major issue among most political parties. Uh, after 1820, it's, it's rarely discussed on a national scene. And you can even see this in the 1844 election selection, right? That, that the two candidates they end up with is Henry Clay, a slave owner from Kentucky, and uh, James Polk, a slave owner from Tennessee. I mean, so clearly no one's taking a very strong stance on this. And uh, some newspapers look at Joseph and, and, and attack him for being an abolitionist, for, 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 for speaking out against slavery in this way. Uh, as part of their discussions about pushing the presidential campaign forward and looking for a place where they might find uh, respite, uh, th this is uh, how the Council of 50 record, uh, the Council of 50 is going to be organized and how this record is going to be kept. So I, I want to share with you some, some insights from it, some teachings that come from it, um, and I'll try to leave some time for some questions. Although I guess if you run out of time, you don't have time for questions, then you can run off the stage and no one knows you don't know anything. Um, one of the uh, 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 things that I found very interesting in the Council of 50 is because they're talking about this council and how a council should function, that it actually gives us a little bit of a, an insight into at least what Joseph Smith's belief uh, of, a, of the proper function of a council. How should a council function? Um, in, in Mormonism today, you might be aware that councils still exist, right? And so uh, maybe this is some good insight that we might be interested in. Um, it, as I'm quoting from this, some of this will be in first person and some of this will be in third person. 
because uh, William Clayton will, will at times be writing in first person for the person speaking and then switch to third person, so you'll just have to, I'm not as schizophrenic as I seem. Um, uh, Joseph Smith arose and said that the committee, uh, so, for, sorry, first of all, uh, let me get to the right page. Um, uh, Joseph first declared of the councils um, that he didn't want to, uh, he wanted everyone in the council to speak their mind, exactly what they thought on any subject. And if they didn't, he would consider them no better than doughheads. I had to search the internet for someone that looked like a doughhead. There you go. Uh, uh, for, for Joseph, he uh, believes that the whole point of having a council is that people are going to actually speak their mind and say what it is that they, what they think. Um, that if you're not going to uh, speak your mind, then there's no point in having a council in the first place. So the whole point is to be able to speak your mind. He'll later go on to say that once the council has then uh, made its decision, uh, that you should respect it. Right? If, you, if you have a problem with the idea that's being discussed, you need to talk about it before they finally make the decision. And uh, one of the quotes that he's going to leave us with is, the reason why men always failed to establish important measures was because in their organization they could never agree to disagree long enough to select the pure gold from the dross by the process of investigation. I think Joseph understood that in this council, in this committee that he was meeting with, that there would be a tendency to want to find out whatever Joseph thought and then hurry and agree with it. Um, some of you may have at some point been involved in a meeting or a council that, where that's the case. And Joseph's saying that actually undermines the whole point of getting people together. The point of getting people together is so that all of the viewpoints can be shared so that you can then determine what is uh, the best course of action. One of the courses of action that they had to, uh, 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 and there, there's this quote about uh, uh, what you should do uh, after you uh, consent to something. Um, one of the questions that they continually had is, is they were supposed to be creating a new constitution. Their plan was to leave the United States and to go somewhere else where they could actually establish the kingdom of God uh, and they could practice their religion without any threat of interference. And to do this, they wanted to, to write a constitution. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a pretty heavy task for this committee. If you're assigned to the Constitution of the Kingdom of God on Earth committee, um, it's a little bit more than Redeem the Dead committee, right, if you remember those, right? So he, he is, uh, uh, the, the, the people assigned to it, they feel great trepidation. They feel almost as if, uh, no matter what we do, we're going to be kind of wrong, right? Uh, because there's no way we're just going to come up with this. Um, and so they actually asked Joseph, well, why don't you just tell us what the Constitution should be, and we'll write it down, and, and that's what we'll end up with. And, and Joseph Smith explains why he wants them to put forth all of their efforts to come up with the best Constitution they can come up with first. He says that the committee was first appointed to bring forth all of the intelligence they could, and when their productions were presented to him, he could then correct the errors and fill in the interstices where it was lacking. It is necessary for the council to exhaust all of their wisdom, and except that they do, they will never know, but they are as wise as God himself. And ambitious men will, like Lucifer, think that they are as wise as God and will try to lift themselves up and put their foot on the necks of others. There has always been some man to put himself forward and to say, I, I am the great. I want the council to exert all of their wisdom in this thing, and when they see that they cannot get a perfect law for themselves, and I can, then they can see from whence wisdom flows. The very interesting teaching that Joseph demonstrates here is that in order for them to fully be able to accept the revelation when it comes, they need to actually put forth all of their own effort. So otherwise, Joseph might present it to them and say, well, if I was doing it, I would have come up with this. Actually, you did try, and you didn't come up with that, right? Uh, that you already know what you could or couldn't come up with. And so uh, the council will labor on uh, trying to create the Constitution. Eventually, Joseph will give them what the Constitution is, and it's a revelation from God, and it's only two lines. And so uh, they did expend a great deal of energy uh, without uh, maybe that they might have viewed as, as not being as essential energy, but they do receive it by revelation from Joseph eventually. In the conversation about these things, you also hear, you hear other people weigh in as well. For instance, we get uh, conversations from Brigham Young. Uh, the Council of 50 Minutes demonstrates, as well as everything else in Brigham Young's life, uh, his absolute and complete devotion to Joseph Smith. Um, his devotion to Joseph Smith is on display 
before Joseph dies. It's on display after Joseph dies. In fact, uh, during one of the conversations after Joseph has been murdered, uh, Alman Babbitt, um, if those of you who know church history, know Alman Babbitt has... Uh, he's, a, he's a colorful his, a person in, in church history. Um, uh, Alman Babbitt will make some comments that Brigham Young perceives as criticizing Joseph Smith. And Brigham Young interrupts the meeting and says, all right, that, that's, I've made up my mind that I will never listen to someone speak against Joseph in my presence. And so you, you certainly get that. When they're talking about this concept of, of allowing revelation to dictate how their new kingdom might be formed, uh, Brigham Young will weigh in on some things that I think are, 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 are pretty interesting teachings, pretty profound. I'm going to share those. Um, Brigham said that he felt as exalted as views... I know that's almost impossible to read, sorry. Um, uh, he felt as exalted as views as he could as he could. He contemplated kings and governments as they are, and they sunk into oblivion when he compared them with this kingdom which was only now an embryo, and it would soon send forth its influence throughout the nations. There would be no doubt, uh, there would no doubt be a regular organization. He has heard much said on the subject of bringing forth a constitution, but he considered himself highly honored to have this privilege of being accounted a fool, that when we had done all that we were capable to do, he could have the Lord speak and tell us what is right. There is a great deal already written, and we can form uh, to ourselves, independent of the word of the Lord, the best system of government on earth. But after all this, when we have done all the Lord, uh, the Lord uh, when we have done all, the Lord will make just right. He can form a constitution by which he is willing to be governed. He is willing to be ruled by the means which God would appoint. And this is Brigham. Brigham, uh, he don't believe that we can adopt laws for the government of people in futurity. We can, for the time being, point out laws for the present necessities. He supposed that there had not yet been a perfect revelation given because we cannot understand it. Yet we receive a little here and a little there. He should not be stumbled if the prophet should translate the Bible 40,000 times over. And yet it should be different in some places every time. Because when God speaks, he always speaks according to the capacity of the people. Uh, that's a pretty profound uh, statement that uh, Brigham Young is going to, to make there. And he's actually going to reiterate this in several sermons he'll give in Utah, that the, the nature of revelation is such that God speaks to people as they have the ability to understand it, which is part of the reason why uh, people shouldn't uh, fret too much over a revelation that says one thing and then a revelation later that says something a little bit different or a little bit more because God speaks to people um, uh, according to their capacity. The starting point for the government of the kingdom is the book of Doctrine and Covenants. He does not know how much more there is in the bosom of the Almighty. When God sees that his people have enlarged upon that which has been given them, he will give us more. The starting point is here. But God has not come here. He has sent his agent, his minister to act in his name. And if he has got an agent to dictate to us here, the organization is here. When a man is clothed with authority to do all the business for those who sent him, what, what he does is right. And this is the kind of agent that we have got. And God appointed him. He's speaking of Joseph. We did not appoint him. If the Lord Almighty calls upon one of his servants as a minister, the nation to whom he is sent has no control over him whatsoever. If the Latter-day Saints believe that our prophet has fallen, what are they going to do? How will they help themselves? It is the prerogative of the Almighty to differ from his subjects in what he pleases or how and when he pleases and what they will do. And what will they do? They must bow to it or kick themselves to death or to hell. Joseph Smith can disagree with the whole church as he has a mind to. And how? Because he is a perfect committee of himself. He would rather have the pure revelations of Jesus Christ as they now stand to carry to the nations than anything else. You get this uh, uh, statement from Brigham Young as they're uh, preparing. John Taylor is also going to weigh in. Um, try to find an image of John Taylor without the neck beard, right? So you can think of him as at some point being young. Um, uh, and Taylor is, is going to also reiterate this, that revelation has to come through the prophet for this. If they can get intelligence from God, they can write a correct principles. If not, they cannot. He was always convinced that no power can guide us right but the wisdom of God. It needed a revelation from God to show the first principles of the kingdom of God. No one knew how to baptize or lay on hands until it was revealed through our chairman. The chairman of, is Joseph Smith. National affairs are equally as fallen and degenerate as religious matters. This nation is as far fallen as de and degenerate as any, under, uh, any nation under, earth, under heaven. 
When we were in the world, we were ignorant with regard to correct principles. We are now a little differently situated. We have a portion of the Spirit, but if we get the document anywhere right, it will be because God gives it. And if not, we know nothing but what either you, Joseph Smith, or God teaches us. So you get, again, this idea of devotion. On the more uh, fun side of things, um, uh, I should probably uh, 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 say that after Joseph Smith is murdered, that's not fun, but after Joseph Smith is murdered, uh, the council is going to, to pause in their, crea- in their meetings for, for quite some time. Uh, this is, is a very difficult blow to all of them. But when they meet again, they're going to still try to continue to carry out Joseph Smith's wishes. And, and Brigham Young will just adamantly believe that everything he is doing is exactly what Joseph wanted to do and what Joseph would have done had Joseph been there. They'll actually have conversations like that in the council where the argument they'll make for a position they take is this is what Joseph wanted. Right? So they very much feel like they're trying to take up uh, the mantle uh, that Joseph has given them. And at the same time, uh, Joseph Smith's murder, it really makes them feel, uh, many of them feel quite embittered uh, towards certainly the way the country has acted towards them. Um, uh, one example of this is, is found with uh, probably one of the most famous people in uh, Mormon history. Uh, in fact, has to be the most famous person in Mormon history who wrote absolutely nothing in his life. Uh, Porter Rockwell is totally illiterate. Uh, He doesn't have the ability to even sign his own name. In fact, any Porter Rockwell document we have is an X with someone after it signing Porter Rockwell's X, uh, explaining who it was. And and so we actually, for all the biographies that are written about Rockwell and every fireside you've ever been to, um, none of that actually comes from Rockwell himself because he wrote nothing. And, and so you actually have very little that comes from him, and it isn't a reminiscence of someone saying, oh, I remember crazy Border Rockwell when he did this, right? Um, here in the council meeting, because Rockwell speaks, and, Will, uh, and William Clayton jots it down as he's speaking, you get a little bit of an insight into the character of Porter Rockwell. And you're not surprised at what Rockwell has to say. Um, uh, as they're discussing the fact that even though Joseph has been murdered, Mob violence is still rising up in and around Nauvoo. This did not end anti-Mormon sentiment in the area, and, and things are, 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 are steadily declining, not getting better for their position in Nauvoo. And as they're discussing this, uh, Rockwell says this, um, uh, I say yes to everything that is good and right. I was a friend to Joseph while he lived, and I am still his friend. He can't avenge his wrongs himself, but I mean to avenge them for him. And if I get into trouble, I want you to help me if you can, and this is how it's actually written in the minutes, without criminating yourselves, which is probably exactly how he said it. And then uh, probably in the best insight into his character that you could find, he said, I love my friends and I hate my enemies. I can't love them if I would. So maybe uh, our view of Porter Rockwell isn't as much of a caricature as, as, we, as it might seem. It certainly seems to fit the, the mold. Um, as I said, there's, there's a great deal of, of anxiety and sadness and loss among these people that you feel pretty palpably as you go through the minutes. They, they, they feel a, a loss, and not just as Joseph as a friend and as a leader, but, but a loss of faith really in the institutions of the government, which had already been going down pretty quickly. Um, but here, uh, their prophet and, and, and his brother had been murdered. And you have John Taylor again. Um, uh, um, I don't know if I have his image here again. Uh, yeah, John Taylor is going to again comment on this. And you can feel his bitterness at the loss of Joseph Smith as he talks about it. In regard to the situation of the world as it now exists, I don't care a damn because they are as corrupt as the devil. We have no benefit from the laws of the land. And the only reason why they don't cut our throats is because they dare not. Uh, As Brother Kimball says, I don't care how often the bucket is turned up. Some cry out, it will bring persecution. So he's responding to the fact that some people feel like if they take a more hardened stance against the persecution they're facing, that it will cause people to persecute them. And John Taylor thinks that's a pretty specious argument, given what's already happened. Um, uh, he He says, they cannot lie about us or persecute us any worse than they have done. 
I go in for whipping the scoundrels when they come in our midst. And if any of them come near me, I will use my cane on them. And I want my brethren to do the same. Um, he, uh, to do likewise. He goes on to speak specifically about some, um, some local uh, 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 constables that he believes are violating their oath of office. But he says um, that... Uh, uh, we know, we know we have no more justice here, no more than we could get at the gates of hell. And the only thing that we have got to do is to take care of ourselves. As to the other thing which has been proposed about seeking out a location in the West, I don't care how soon it goes into operation. People talk about law and justice. I go in for giving them the same kind of justice they give us. I go in for a company being sent out to find a place where we can establish a kingdom and erect the standard and dwell in peace and have our own laws. Uh, so you kind of get uh, from uh, the statement here of, of, of John Taylor, you get a little bit of this, you'll certainly see this in Taylor's publication in the Times and Seasons as well, that there is a real sense of loss and bitterness that they feel like they're being driven out of the nation. In fact, if, if I go back here uh, to the places that they're considering as a location uh, uh, to move, you can see that all of the places they are considering they're deliberately considering them because they're not in the United States. The plan is to get out of the United States. We've tried the United States. We tried the United States in New York. That didn't work. We tried it in Ohio. It didn't work. Tried it in Missouri. It didn't work. And here we are in Illinois, and it's not working. And so the idea is if we can get outside of the United States, then maybe we can finally live our religion in peace. For a long time, they're actually really considering uh, going to Texas. Uh, they, they send representatives there. They, they discuss it. They talk about it for quite some time. But in the end, the reason why they drop Texas as a possibility isn't because they've ever been there in the summer. It's because they, uh, I apologize if you're from Texas, but not really because you've been there too. Um, uh, the, the main reason why they decide to drop Texas as a possible place is they're actually in the midst of a meeting discussing a possible removal to Texas when a messenger comes into the meeting and says, Texas has just been annexed by the United States. And they immediately drop it as an option. Because the whole point is to get out of the United States. If we go to Texas, we're still under the same jurisdiction of the same laws, of the same judges, of the same uh, president who will do nothing to help us in, in the persecution that we face. Uh, and so uh, the upper California... Uh, the portion of, of Mexico that is um, certainly occupied by Native Americans, um, but essentially unoccupied uh, by, by whites, is, is what then becomes the, the focus of their, their plans. Um, there's obviously lots of things I could share, but I want to have a, a, a few minutes for questions, despite my uh, attempt to go over. And uh, so the last thing I want to share is probably the most beautiful aspect of uh, the most beautiful teaching that I found going through um, the minutes, and that is Joseph Smith, while he's still alive, is going to give a pretty lengthy discourse on the ideas of tolerance and religious freedom and an opposition uh, to, to religious bigotry. Uh, as they're talking about forming this new council, Joseph deliberately wants non-Mormons to be a part of it. He, he, wants, he wants it to be inclusive because he wants this to be a, a, a kingdom that's inclusive of, of many people. He believes he's setting up the political kingdom of God on earth for, for Jesus to take when, when Jesus returns again. And so because of that, uh, Joseph will, will, will speak pretty freely. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, William Clayton records that while Joseph is talking about this, he's kind of beating a, a ruler on his hand and on the table as he's talking and eventually snaps it over his knee. Um, uh, so you can kind of see Joseph per, uh, perhaps a bit exercised as he's saying this. Um, but this is, uh, when we get past our dough, we can always go back to that. But um, uh, this is what uh, Joseph is saying at the time. For the benefit of mankind and for succeeding generations, Joseph wished it to be recorded that there are men admitted to this honorable council who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Neither do they profess any creed or religious sentiment whatsoever. To show them the organization of the kingdom, men are not consulted as to their religious opinions or notions in any shape, form whatsoever. That we act upon the broad and liberal principle that all men have equal rights and ought to be respected. And that every man has a privilege in this organization of choosing for himself voluntarily as God 
and what he pleases for his religion. Inasmuch as there is no danger that every man will embrace the greatest light. This is a teaching that Joseph gives in Nauvoo on another occasion as well. When he's asked why does he allow uh, preachers from other religion to come preach to the people, he simply says that he, he doesn't believe these preachers are going to deliver any more light than, than he has for them, right? People will come back to where the greatest light is. God cannot save or damn a man only on the principle that every man acts, chooses, and worships for himself. Hence the importance of thrusting from us every spirit of bigotry and intolerance towards a man's religious sentiments, that spirit which has drenched the earth in blood. When a man feels the least temptation to such intolerance, he ought to spurn it from him. It becomes our duty on account of this intolerance and corruption because it is the inalienable right of a man being to think as he pleases, to worship as he pleases, being the first law of everything that is sacred. It is our duty then to guard every ground all the days of our lives. I will appeal to every man in this council, beginning at the youngest, that when he arrives at the years of a hoary age, he will have to say that the principles of intolerance and bigotry never had a place in this kingdom, nor in my breast, and that he is then, even then, ready to die rather than to yield to such things. Nothing can reclaim the human mind from its ignorance, bigotry, superstition, etc., but the grand and sublime principles of equal rights and universal freedom to all men. We must not despise a man on account of his infirmity. We ought to love a man more for his infirmity. To me, that's one of the most beautiful sentiments of the 19th century. Nothing is more congenial to my feelings and principles than the principles of universal freedom, and it has been from the beginning. If I can know that a man is susceptible to good feelings and integrity and that he will stand by his friends, he is my friend. The only thing that I'm afraid of is that I will not live long enough to enjoy the society of these my friends as long as I want to. Let us from henceforth then drive from us every species of intolerance. When a man is free, he is then capable of being a critic. When I've used every means in my power to exalt a man's mind, and have taught him the righteous principles to no effect, and he is still inclined in his darkness. Yet the same principles of liberty and charity would ever be manifested by me as though he had embraced the gospel. Hence, in all governments and political transactions, a man's religious opinion should never be called into question. A man should be judged by the law independent of religious prejudice. Hence, we want in our Constitution those laws which require of its officers to administer justice without regard to a man's religious sentiment or to thrust him out of office. Um, you get a little bit of an insight there. Of course, Joseph, as someone who has suffered uh, through religious intolerance and persecution from the, from the time he first told anyone about the first vision all throughout uh, the growing persecution that would would at least in part eventually lead to his murder only a few months later. Uh, he has very strong feelings about this. And a beautiful sentiment that he expresses that even if you're not able to convince uh, everybody of the truthfulness of, of, of the things you have to share, even if they still don't accept it, even after you've laid out all of the best arguments you can possibly lay out, we should still love those people they're still God's children, uh, we'll all eventually know who we really are one day. And, and arguments uh, about things today might seem much more semantic in that sense. So um, I, I, I thought I'd share that because I think that um, it, it is a great uh, demonstration of Joseph Smith's character. I'm often asked about Joseph Smith, uh, having worked on the Joseph Smith papers, and one of the things of his character that always comes through to me is, is, through to me is is his, his great love of other people. He was a lover of other people. He loved being around other people. He loved to be with other people. He loved to see other people happy. And oftentimes his love of other people led him to make terrible decisions, which as a historian you can look back and say, no, don't trust John C. Bennett. He's, yeah, but um, um, I, I, I believe that um, whatever one thinks of Mormonism, uh, the sentiment that we should not despise someone because of their infirmity, but that we should love them more simply because they're infirm is a beautiful sentiment that anyone can get behind. 
uh, anyone, whether they're a member of the church or not, whether they feel their way inside of the church or they feel themselves falling out, uh, the love uh, that we can show to one another, I think, is something that we should all take away from the teachings of Joseph Smith. Um, I'll now uh, stop and let you ask any questions. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how this works. Uh, you have, are you collecting questions? Are you, do I let people just stand up and shout? Um, Okay, sounds good. Um, I, I, these are, I'm guessing, in no particular order. I don't know if he stacked the deck. Hopefully there's a really easy question, like, how old was Joseph Smith? And then I go, oh, actually, I'll spend 35 minutes on that. Um, um, uh, so let's see here. What is this? I can't read that one. Sorry, that one. I can read 19th century handwriting pretty well. Oh, okay. I, okay, that, that's probably what that says. Okay. Um, uh, the question is... Uh, do you think then that we should stop saying the land, uh, oh sorry, the Lord chose the United States to restore the gospel since there was uh, religious freedom, since clearly our religion was so sorely persecuted? Uh, we, I, that's a great question. I, I'm, uh, I have no ability to deliver what we should or shouldn't say. I mean, as, as a historian and not a very good one at that, I can merely state what the records say. Um, in my opinion, um, the, the fact that the, the, that the United States was the place that the, the church was restored, I think, is still something we can talk about. Clearly, the United States has a, a greater freedom of religion uh, than, than other places at the time. Um, uh, you can ask uh, the many people who are uh, executed or thrown in prison uh, in Europe uh, for expressing different religious views that... that uh, uh, how much religious freedom they had. I, I think we should probably uh, modify a little bit the way that we talk about it. I, I think it's, for Mormons today, we, we kind of have a, uh, sorry, American Mormons, we kind of have a, a, a competing ideas, right? I, most uh, American Mormons feel very strongly uh, their, their American patriotism as well as their Mormonism. And, and they often want to see those two things expressed at the same time, and they often are. And so it becomes a little bit difficult when we read about anything in the 19th century, uh, because however much uh, the United States might have been the land of freedom where the church was founded, um, by the time of Joseph Smith's murder, they had come to the conclusion that, that the problem in the United States was that minority rights were not protected. And that what good does it say that you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness if in fact anyone can take away your right to your freedom of religion, your liberty if you're in liberty jail, or your, your, your life in fact, which is what happens. I would say we'd probably want to, to you know, I, I think it's clearly the church is restored uh, in uh, the United States and, and that's where it was restored and so that, that's certainly a fact of the matter. But you should probably also not be surprised to find Wilfred Woodruff in the 1860s grumbling about how sinful the United States is. Uh, because at that point, they, they feel pretty, pretty strongly against the, the actions that have been taken. Oh, is there, oh my goodness. Uh, we're going to have to speed read these. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let's see, I should probably do these in the order of the ones I got first, right? Um, after Joseph Smith's death, is there discussion in the Council of 50 about who will succeed and how the next leader will be chosen? There is a, a great discussion in it. Uh, of course, the Council of 50 is functioning as an independent body, separate from the Quorum of the Twelve. It's just often it doesn't appear very separate because all the members of the Quorum of the Twelve are members of the Council of Fifty. So they will often transact uh, a business that kind of falls along similar lines. They will have a discussion in their earliest meetings after they, they get back together in which they will uh, unanimously select Brigham Young to be the new chairperson of the council. He will uh, take up exactly where Joseph is, and actually all of the people in the council will go around making a statement to the effect of, yes, Brigham Young is, is the person who should lead us now. Um, they, they do have some bit of discussion about the uh, other uh, succession crisis that's going on at the time, and so they will talk about Rigdonism uh, and, and things like that in the council, 
but they're talking about them more as, as outside events. There's no discussion in the council of, well, what do you think? Is Sidney Rigdon the guy? They, they don't have that discussion um, in the council. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so this is a, a, a good question. Um, Though we chuckle at some of the uh, understandably strong LDS pronouncements after the martyrdom, these sentiments, what led to the Mountain Meadows Massacre, um, that, that would certainly be a, a, a gross oversimplification of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, and, and to whoever wrote the question, of course, you only had a small space to write it in. Um, there are a myriad of uh, uh, both uh, uh, aggravating and mitigating events surrounding the Mountain Meadows Massacre um, to say that had uh, John Taylor not been mad at the United States that, that uh, Joseph Smith was murdered, the, the Mountain Meadows Massacre wouldn't have occurred, would probably not be a very accurate statement. That people who leave the United States have a shared collective memory of both mobs and organized military units conducting widespread depredations, murders, rapes, uh, house burnings, farm burnings. It, if they hadn't had that, then that would probably be a much more deciding factor. Certainly it is the case anecdotally, and, and, and you know, there's, um, you, you can get uh, Rick Turley up here and have him speak about the Mountain Meadows Massacre far better than, than me. Um, that certainly is the case that, that some of, of the rhetoric leading up to the massacre, in, in part, it, it surrounds the fact that they are a, a people that have been persecuted and driven out. And so when people say things uh, to the effect of, of, of there's an army on the way to destroy you, you take it seriously if you've gone through Hans Mill. You, you don't say, well, maybe. Uh, you, you actually consider it a serious threat. There's no excuse for the horrific murders at Mountain Meadows. I mean, there are, um, there are babies that are murdered. Uh, there's no way to make that okay. It is, it is terrible. It is horrific. Um, it, is, it is a massacre, and uh, it's hard to deal with. Um, Well-intended people sometimes make horrible, horrible, horrible mistakes. And unfortunately, in this case, the mistake they made was murder. Um, and so I, I, think, uh, I don't think uh, that it's purely on the basis of any statements that are made. Far more is the fact that it is the, the, um, the shared collective experience of ongoing persecution that, that has a psychological effect on people that are there. Um, I guess I should probably try to get some from both. Um, oh, I did that one. I did that one. I did that one. Um, at what point in Joseph's development did he transition from a third grade expression uh, to uh, becoming an eloquent orator and a profound thinker and philosopher? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, we often say that, you know, Joseph Smith had a third grade education. I don't know if he really had that. It's not like he went to grade school. I mean, um, and uh, Joseph uh, is always intelligent. I, I think anyone who's a teacher can tell you that you can tell native intelligence inside uh, one of your students just because they don't know how, you know, multiplication tables work. That's not actually evidence of, of, of someone not being intelligent. Once they're taught them, then they can use them, right? Uh, so Joseph, you know, as, as, as stated, you know, only has the ground rules of, of those things. But he really puts, sets himself to work uh, trying to educate himself. I mean, you see this with their early attempt to learn Hebrew. Joseph uh, uh, becomes pretty well read. And by the time he's in Nauvoo, I mean, he, is, he seems to be reading a great deal. Uh, and, and that is all being soaked up. But yeah, if you read a letter from 1833, uh, he writes a letter to the church in Missouri in 1833 where he's talking about uh, the good doctor, Philassus Hurlbut. Um, and uh, uh, Boy, there's, there's probably not a grammatically accurate sentence in that letter. And there's almost no correct spelling. Uh, even doctor is spelled wrong. Even hurlbutt's spelled wrong, which I'm fine with. Um, <laughs> obviously, spelling is uh, uh, a little bit more fluid in the 19th century. Sometimes people will say, oh, it didn't matter how you spelled things. That's not really accurate. They do have a, a way of spelling things. There's a pretty... Uh, uh, 
standard way of spelling things, you can see this just from newspapers, right? You don't pick up a newspaper and it, you know, spells church with an I. Um, that, honestly, that is one of my favorite misspellings of Joseph is early on in his life when he's writing something, a lot of the time he misspells church with an I. He spells it C-H-I-R, the church. Um, he also misspells Edward Partridge's name all the time, leaving the R out. Instead of Partridge, he writes Patridge. Uh, it, Joseph's from Vermont, so my guess is uh, that he has kind of a New England accent. He doesn't have a Utah accent. So I know that for many of you, that's going to cause you to lose your faith, to think of Joseph uh, saying, uh, you, know, you know, me and Edward Patridge going to go to the church, maybe catch a Sox game. I don't, I, mean, uh, I, I don't know if that's how he was talking about it, but... Uh, uh, Joseph, you can, see, uh, you can see in his writing um, that he certainly is becoming more well-read. He certainly is understanding, even his, under, his, his uh, uh, efforts to, to alter and, and to update the Book of Mormon in 1837, it's almost purely on the grounds of, well, I learned that you probably shouldn't use the word that there, and he, he's trying to change it to make it more grammatically accurate. Um, the best change that he makes in the 1837 Book of Mormon is he, he, he takes out dozens of it and it came to pass. So as often as you read it, it was actually way more uh, that, it, that it used to say it way more than that. So um, he, he becomes more, uh, he certainly uh, becomes more proficient as time goes on, which is something you might expect from someone. Although I, I would say that still, reading a letter from 1838 you would have a very hard time comparing that to the Book of Mormon and saying, oh, this is the same level of writing, even when he's making the effort. Um, am I out of time? Do I? I can do one more. I can't do anything quick. I think that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're okay. We, we, we have uh, time for a break. And... Okay, yeah. If, if I keep people from getting a muffin or something, that'll be the, that's the death. Um, Okay, the last one I have, I apologize if I didn't get to yours. Uh, clearly, I deliberately didn't do it because we believe in conspiracy theories. But um, um, uh, what lessons from the Council of 50 can we apply to our wards and state, ward and state councils? I think kind of the ones that were presented there, I, I don't know that we aren't trying to run our ward and state councils the way that Joseph talks about it. I know I've certainly been in some where they weren't run that way, but uh, um, the... The, uh, and, and I'm not saying this just because I have a former bishop here. I have a former bishop from Colorado when I was getting my PhD here. And uh, I was never in his ward council because he never thought I was worthy because I was getting a PhD in history. Um, but uh, the, uh, I think one of the takeaways that we sh is that there is a real rush uh, in any meeting. It's not just a church meeting. In any meeting where you know people have different ideas and different personalities, there is a real tendency among especially people trying to live a Christ-like life, and I'm not saying I'm one of those people, but, but that to, to try to be agreeable for agreeableness sake, right? And when someone says, well, I think we should, you know, uh, you know, hold a pool party for award fundraiser, and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's the worst idea I've ever heard in my life. Uh, and, and instead you say, yeah, let's do that. And, and uh, I think that, that what Joseph really wanted brought to the fore is not that uh, people should have long, drawn-out arguments, but that people should honestly express what they really feel, listen to what other people actually have to say, and then, yes, you are going to have to come to a consensus. This isn't a, you know, like Martin Luther saying, here I stand, I can do no other uh, over the pool party, right? Uh, but, but, but that you can't properly make the best decision without everybody's input. Another example of how valuable Joseph thought other people were. It, you had to have the input of everybody because only then in the hashing out could you actually say, man, that was a really good idea, but you know what? If we had a little bit, of, that's, that's actually an even better idea. Uh, so he, he certainly thinks counsel should function to be honest, to be open. And yes, uh, another takeaway is once the council's made a decision, don't be the person going out of the ward council saying, well, I think the Relief Society made a really big mistake on that and telling everybody in the ward, right? I mean, that, that, that once the decision's made, try as best you can to support it. And I think that's a pretty good takeaway, and I'm probably out of time. All right. <laughs> All right.